Hi, everyone. I am super excited about today's interview. I have a very special guest on the show today, and we're going to be talking all around the topic of time-restricted eating, uh, specifically for shift workers, which is a very hot topic in the wellness uh, sphere, but especially relevant when it comes to uh, shift workers. So I have uh, the lovely Dr. Emily Manugian, who is um, joining us all the way from the United States. She's a postdoctoral research researcher at the Salk Institute in San Diego, California. She studies the intricate interaction between our body's biological rhythms and the timing of our daily habits. These internal rhythms interact with our daily behaviours of when and how much we sleep, eat and exercise. And as the head of the human research in Dr. Sachin Panda's lab in at Salk, Emily investigates how the timing of these behaviours relate to our health. So welcome, Dr. Manugian. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you um, for joining me. I've, yeah, as I said off air, I've uh, been secretly stalking you a little bit and I'm so excited to be talking to you today because I know that uh, every single listener is going to be able to relate to uh, some of the things that you're going to be sharing with us. And the how I stumbled across you uh, was that you did a study um, called the Healthy Heroes uh, Study and um, obviously involved shift workers. But before we get into the actual nitty gritties of the of the research, I'd love for you, because our listeners are from all different realms of shift working backgrounds, some have science, some have don't, I'd love for you to be able to share with our listeners what exactly is chronobiology and how did you get into it? Yeah, and thanks for having me because, you know, connecting with the people that our work could affect is is super important. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so chronobiology, and I think a lot of scientific terms just sound a lot more complicated than they are. Um, it's just the study of time. And it's not just like the physics of time, but how our bodies relate to time, how all life relates to time, um, and kind of how time plays a role in how our, our bodies work and how organisms work in general. Because today we're mainly going to be talking about human biological clocks, but it's important to remember every living thing has a clock down from a, a single cell organism to plants, to animals, we all have clocks. And they're really just a way to help our bodies coordinate with the environment because we live in a world that changes every, you know, we have a 24 hour cycle of day and night and a world that spins and temperature that changes and all these other things. And so biological clocks are just a way of helping yourself to coordinate with that environment. Um, I got into chronobiology um, when I was an undergraduate um, in college. I was um, taking a class on hormones and behavior, actually. Um, and it was like a neuroendocrinology course, and they got into seasonal reproduction. And that kind of tangent led to a tangent of biological clocks and how animals can understand what time of year it is. Because we're talking about daily clocks when we say circadian, there's many different durations. So we, our body clocks don't only look at a day. They also can track years or months. There's different durations of time that they can track. And so I got really interested in seasonal reproduction and how our bodies can tell this time. And then from there, I ended up getting into circadian biology. Um, and I worked in a lab uh, there for a couple of years. And then I went on to study it further in my PhD. And now um, as a postdoc and uh, staff scientist here at Salk. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So it's, and, and I think, because it's it's so different, isn't it? Like it's not a real, it's not in the mainstream medicine that um, I don't know about you, but that's what I'm kind of drawn to, to sort of hear what people were not not talking about as opposed to hearing the yeah. same thing over and over again. I don't know about you, but that's kind of how I've kind of yeah. erred on towards chrononutrition and stuff like that. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people, know, like it makes sense because we because we all have clocks. We've all yeah. felt what it feels like to have disrupted clocks with like jet lag or sleep mm -hmm. disruption. We know what it feels like to hurt your clocks. We don't always know when we're hurting our clocks, like eating really late at night or something that we might not think about as being disruptive yeah. or, you know, just social cues in general about really late night outings and lots of light or television or, you know, exciting things going on at these kind of really odd hours or having to have really long commutes for things like shift work, which are very challenging for our bodies to do because we're just not built for it. Mm. Um, and so I think when you've had those experiences, you really know 
what it feels like <laughs> to have those disrupted. You kind of have this intuition. And a lot of the things we'll talk about, someone might say, oh, yeah, my grandma used to say that. Or I've heard this in this like ancient thing where these things kind of resonate because we kind of come back to it. And the research of the, and the science behind why all those things are and how we can optimize our bodies is really kind of expanding dramatically right now. Um, but it's always been there. It's just unfortunately, it hasn't been in medical schools. It's something we're actively working on as, as, a, as a scientific community to get more circadian research into medical schools so doctors understand and can implement these types of things. Um, you're starting to see it come up more in sleep clinics and things like that. But there's still a long way to go to really um, kind of take advantage of the knowledge that we have. Because like you said, I think this is a whole area of health that has been ignored for far too long. And when you ignore it, you accidentally hurt it. And I think it's leading to a lot of bad mm. downstream effects. Yeah, exactly. And it is, it's, it's extraordinary that this is not sort of uh, spoken about in, in mainstream medicine and taught through university, the doctors and nurses and everything. But uh, yeah, as I said, that's a whole different, <laughs> whole different topic of conversation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'd love for, to um, get into the, the study that you did because uh, um, for our listeners, a lot of research um, that gets published is uh, done actually on animal studies and um, or and in laboratories, and they're not actually specifically uh, demonstrating the actual shift worker. And this is what Emily's study is so um, so brilliant. Uh, could you? I guess, firstly, um, introduce again to our listeners, because it was a randomized control trial. Like, what is that? Yeah, so a randomized control trial just means as we accept participants into the study, they'll be randomized, and we don't know what it's going to be ahead of time. Either we have a third party uh, statistician who's kind of telling us as soon as it's time to be randomized, um, which group someone goes into. So we have two different groups. One in this case, one was standard of care, which was standard nutritional advice, which is a Mediterranean diet. Um, and the other group was that same dietary advice, but they were also had to adhere to a 10 hour time restricted eating regimen that was personalized to their schedule, at least on non work days. Um, but they had to follow that, that same 10 hours of eating window, all days, work days or off days. Right. Okay. Yep. And so what exactly also is because this was done on shift workers now when we think of I've spoken to clients over the years about time restricting eating and not eating during the night and a lot of people kind of just go into shutdown mode to just think there's no way I could not eat during the night yeah can you what what exactly is involved in that time restricting eating from a time perspective yeah 100 percent. and and you know to be fair if you say I do shift work it could mean anything, right? And I, I'm sure you're aware of this in post and the listeners are aware of this, but shift work could be almost any schedule. It could be rotating shifts, it could be morning, it could be late, it could be night. Um, and depending on the shift, it's going to be easier or harder to stick to some kind of regimen, you know, timed eating window that aligns with your off days. And there are legitimate schedules that are make this very challenging. Um, and for those people, we're looking for alternatives and we are... We're looking to pursue research to have modifications of this to allow for different, you know, maybe look at the types of foods that you're eating at different times of day. Um, that that research just isn't done yet, but it's something I'm really passionate about because I, I recognize how challenging this can be on certain schedules. Mm. Um, we took a little bit of an easy way out. We started with what I think is probably the easiest, sh not easiest shift, but easiest shift to do a time restricted eating, which is a 24 hour shift. Where, um, so if you're working in firefighters that work at least one 24 hour shift, they can work up to four 24 hour shifts in a row. Um, and actually, if there's a fire emergency, that four hour day, that four day rule goes away and they can work multiple weeks continuously. But their day is still their day. They're all awake during the day. They may take a nap, but they're awake during the day. During the night, they try to sleep and they're able to sleep unless they get pulled out on a call. So depending on the station, if it's a quiet station and you only get one or two calls, your sleep might not be as disrupted and you're still mainly sleeping in the evening. Whereas other stations that are very busy, which I had the you know privilege to get to go and do a 24 hour ride along at one of the busier stations, you're woken up almost constantly. And yes, you do get to sleep kind of, but um, it's a very disrupted, very 
um, broken up anxiously where you, it almost feels that you hadn't slept at all. Um, but it's easier for eating in the sense that everyone is mainly eating during the day and the fire stations, they, in, at least in San Diego, they're eating um, lunch and dinner together. They actually cook as a group and eat together. So your main meals are happening during the day. Mm-hmm. And it's really just kind of snacking that would happen late at night. And so in that way, we had it a little bit easier. We could say, okay, we're going to cut out all the things you might have in the middle of the night. You know, you're really going to just stick to this 10 hours. Um, but at the same time, you know, one of our biggest question here was feasibility was, mm-hmm. is it possible to do time restricted eating on a 24 hour shift and not have problems with energy levels or headaches or feeling lethargic, you know, or feeling weak or any other types you know, alertness. I mean, being a firefighter is a very demanding job, both mentally and physically. And so, you know, that's a serious concern if people didn't feel like they were going to be able to perform their best. Um, you know, we don't want that to be happening at all. So the first question was, could they do this? Um, and then after that, if, if they can, what are the potential? Yeah. Yeah. So um, how did it go? Yeah. So it went well. Um, so we recruited, we had 150 firefighters from San Diego County um, get randomized into the trial. Um, 137 completed, which is great. We usually expect about a 20% dropout rate just due to life and different things that may happen. You know, some, someone might move, someone, yeah, you know, there's always something that happens. So you expect about a 20% dropout rate. And we had a lot less than that. So that was exciting to see. Um, and yeah, we found it was feasible. We actually had no adverse effects. So there was no complaints of feeling weak or having bad headaches or anything like that, um, which was really exciting to see. Um, we did allow black coffee as needed although we still saw coffee dramatically drop down outside of the eating window. Um, so even though it was allowed, it was, it was decreased dramatically and it was rarely needed. Um, and to our surprise, we had, well, not maybe to our surprise, a little bit, but to our hope, uh, it was nice to see that it was replicated. But people said they actually felt like they had a little bit more energy, um, that they felt better while doing it. Um, and again, this is not a very severe um fasting regimen they're still able to eat for 10 hours a day um and we let them choose this based on their schedule and this is mainly for off days because out of all of this feasibility we actually found they have the hardest time sticking to it on their not work days um and that's because the you know when you're in the station one you can't drink (laughs) so you're not going to have a beer at night with your friends um Whereas you really might want to when you're on your off days. That was actually their biggest struggle was people saying, you know, I, you know, we're going out. I really want to have a drink with my friends at night. Uh, yeah. And that's something that is not specific to shift work. That's, that's true for anyone. Um, and with something like that, we would, you know, we would say, look, if it happens every so often, that's not a problem. It's, it's most of the time you should not be going outside that window, you know, kind of like having a, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to tell you to not have cake on your birthday, but you probably shouldn't eat cake every day, you know, um, similar kind of thing. So um, we found it was feasible. It was really exciting to see. We didn't see any negative effects. Um, and in the uh, group of participants that had elevated um, uh, HbA1c, which is a kind of an estimate of glucose levels over the past three months, which is kind of the gold standard that we use for, you know, diagnosing prediabetes or diabetes or patients that were pre-diabetic or diabetic, um, they saw a significant reduction in A1C in the TRE group compared to the standard of care group. And similarly, the participants who had elevated blood pressure at baseline, um, that significantly decreased in the TRE group as well, which was really exciting to see because both groups um, had some improvement because, you know, they were following uh, a Mediterranean diet, which is which is kind of the gold standard for what you do for behavioral interventions. Um, and it was really exciting to see that the only difference was when they were eating. Um, and just that small change was able to really improve a lot of their health. And though, even just those two uh, is, in, is incredibly important because shift workers alone are prone to the high blood pressure and the dysregulated blood glucose levels. So 
I think for, yeah, I think for our listeners, I want to sort of just for you to sort of let that sit for a moment uh, because and obviously in the longer that you're working shift workers, we know too a lot of people that get into a shift working role, they don't just do it for one or two years. They can do it for decades because they become professions like your firefighters, your police or, yeah, absolutely. and so forth. And and because of that that disruption in, in their sleep, it does, it, it makes them prone to the the blood pressure thing is is. I've said it practically in every client that that, that they, they have that. So knowing that that's a behavioural change, that's not necessarily requiring a pharmaceutical, just doing that behavioural change of not eating during the night um, can help to, um, you know, recalibrate those. So, uh, again, back and just back a bit for our listeners again. So what time were, were they blocking out to not eat? Yeah, so we we got we let everyone personalize it to their own schedule with a little bit of a caveat. So they had to stop eating at least three hours before their normal bedtime. So if you went to bed at 11, you would need to stop eating by eight, um, which is not like a severe um, thing. And then they had 10 hours. So the the most common eating interval that was chosen was 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. Um, and I think the earliest we had was like a 7 30 or 8 and then the latest we had finishing I think was a 9 p.m so it was kind of in that range of somewhere between 8 a.m and 9 p.m but 10 hour window and so depending on you know if someone's most important meal was dinner with their family at 7 p.m then maybe they're going to make it so they end at 7 30 or 8 and if someone really needs to be with their kids for breakfast in the morning at 7 then they're going to start at 7 you know and I think that that little personalization you know like we didn't put this strict window on it but it still came down to be what it was just by choice when all we say is look make sure it's not just before you go to bed and then pick what works for you and i think that's really important to keep in mind whenever you're trying to put in a new healthy lifestyle habit is it's got to be something that works with your lifestyle if i tell you you can't have dinner with your family anymore i don't care what it does for you you're not going to do it and like i would hate for you to lose that interaction with your family that would be very sad Mm -hmm. um so i think it's a matter of finding what works for you but with a 10-hour eating window you're still having breakfast you're still having lunch you're still having dinner we're not skipping meals here we're just kind of starting our meals a little bit later and finishing them a little bit sooner and really usually it's it's cutting out the extra snacks or just those those kind of small advancements or delays in meals Mm, yeah Brilliant. So there is that little bit of a buffer, that bit of a variability that that can actually be uh, applied. So do you think uh, you saw positive results in all of even the slight variations because of the whole melatonin, uh, insulin, cortisol, glucagon, circadian rhythm? Yeah, absolutely. So I think some of it, you know, sometimes it sounds too good to be true. Like just eat this a little earlier and you'll have all these benefits. But if you think about why it's happening, it makes a lot of sense. So it all comes back to circadian biology and your circadian system is really kind of keeping everything in the right place at the right time. And at night when you're not eating or your body doesn't expect you to be eating, you know, we have, we regulate glucose differently. So our insulin kind of gets shut down and we have glucagon come up. So when your body thinks you'll be asleep, your glucose levels in your blood don't, you know, just tank because you need glucose in your blood to keep your body moving and working, right? But when your body's kind of saying, I'm not expecting to bring anything in, I'm actually using energy stores that we have, this is how we're going to maintain it, you know, kind of base level. When you then come in and have some big carb load or big sugar load or whatever it may be, your body can't handle that. It can't process it normally. And so your glucose spikes up Um, And there's been some really cool work done recently, like in lab studies in humans, showing that when you have, you know, you increase your glucose just before you go to bed, it stays high while you sleep because we don't have the right hormones going around to be able to really regulate that properly. Mm -hmm. And like you said, melatonin is linked to that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, Melatonin is going to make it so your insulin is suppressed. So you're not able to store that glucose that you take into your body if you're eating, you know, when melatonin is high at night or very early morning, you know, um, you're just not able to process it the right way. So when you think about it that way, it makes a lot of sense that your glucose levels would go down a lot. You just don't eat at those times where you'd be overly sensitive to. Um, Similarly, blood pressure has a circadian rhythm as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And we know 
that just based on when you're active, based on when you're eating um, different sodium, con all these things are going to affect your blood pressure. So we think a lot of that is really just tapping into letting the system work properly rather than disrupting it with this, you know, really intensive food cue. Um, and I, I should go back for a second. When we think about circadian disruption and shift work, I think there's really probably four main components. One is just sleep. And unfortunately for shift workers, we can't improve your sleep regimen because you have to be up for the important work that you're doing. Second is light. We also can't change light. Third would be physical or emotional activity, whether, you know, something very stimulating or physically or mentally stimulating. All those things are very disruptive and none of those things we can change. But the fourth big thing is food. Food can also be extremely disruptive to your clocks and to lots of parts of your body. Um, and it really throws off the, the circadian system. But, and that's the one thing that we actually could potentially change. You don't have to eat as part of your job. Um, and again, this is a lot easier for some schedules than others. So I don't want to disregard them. But this is why we started with food, because we saw it as the one place we might be able to actually kind of intervene and hopefully decrease this, you know, physical burden of shift work. Mm, it's a modifiable risk factor. It's that, yeah, lifestyle change that that can actually occur. Yeah. Um, great. So did you, there must have been a few people that were saying, okay, at 2 a.m. I got really, really hungry and they wanted to eat something. There must have been some that said that. You know, our bigger, it wasn't so much 2 a.m. Because, you know, and again, I think that this is the benefit of, of the firefighters is that they get up, you go on a call, you get back and you try to go to sleep. You're not usually hanging out awake, especially if this has been a third, fourth day that you've been doing this kind of a shift, you're exhausted. So you're not staying up unless you have to. So again, that's a big benefit um, that we had where it is a lot easier than, say, a nurse that's doing a 24 hour night sh or a 12 hour night shift where they're actively awake or a doctor or something like that, where they're, you know, or a police officer where you're actively awake that whole time. Um, especially maybe not even a nurse, but maybe a job where you have to be awake, but you're, you know, not actively doing something. Like if you're a guard or a police officer having to mm -hmm. monitor something and you're having to sit, um, yeah. or a truck driver where you're having to sit and it might be, you might be a little bit bored then food is a great way to stimulate you to be awake, right? It's just that's not what your body is ready to happen. So it's kind of this this interesting thing. Um, but that being said, yes, we did have some instances where people would say, hey, this is a, you know, I'm having this kind of transition. I'm trying to figure out how to make this work for me. Um, I think one of the most notable ones we had was someone who was um, part of like a, a biking club where it was not a they weren't biking outside, but it was a, it was a stationary bike, but they would have to bike like 15 or 20 miles a day um, as part of this team. And they would do it at night. And the problem was that was coming outside of their eating window. So then they'd say, I'm doing this really intensive workout and now I need to eat. What do I do? Um, and so that was our first real challenge. Like, all right, let's figure this out. And we were able to kind of help him reschedule it where he could bike a little bit earlier and eat a little bit later. And I think we ended up giving him like a half hour extension. Um, so he was at 10 and a half hours just to try to help him fit that in because realistically life is going to happen. And honestly, I think 10 and a half hours is probably going to be still significantly better than anything else. Yeah. Um, and that ended up working out fine. Um, and, you know, within our population, as well as other studies that don't, with people who don't do shift work, you know, sometimes the first few weeks can be difficult to figure out um, and your body's just kind of getting used to it. So one is figuring out the schedule that works for you, like when you can fit your dinners in, when you can fit your exercise in. I know from personal experience, that was my biggest challenge as well, was figuring out how I can get my workout in before I could have dinner. Because if I worked out too close to dinner, I, you know, I wouldn't feel good while I was working out. Or, you know, if I worked out too late, then that would disrupt my sleep too. So figuring that schedule out, especially like if you are doing shift work or if you have children or you know, other care responsibilities, that can be kind of tricky sometimes. Um, so that's one challenge. And the other is the circadian system is anticipatory. It prepares your body for what it's going to need to be able to do. And so it actually will change appetite over time. But those first couple weeks that you're starting to do this, your body's still used to whatever habits you've been having. And so if you normally eat at 11 or midnight or 
one or two in the morning, your body's, you're still probably going to have that kind of built in expectation of, oh, I, I expect to be eating now, even if it's really not good for you. Um, and so that can take a few weeks to change. Some people, it's just a couple days. Some people don't notice it at all. And some people, it can be quite challenging for four to six weeks. It depends. Um, in, in clinical trials, we do kind of have a, this was your baseline and we're doing this right now. And we're going to go straight to 10 hours. Um, but in the real world, you can taper on and off. You know, I know when I started doing this many years ago now, it was like, okay, first is when do I eat? And I found that out by actually using the app that our, our lab created called My Circadian Cock clock and just um tracking everything that i ate and drank um so i could see like what is my eating window and you know what does this look like and then see okay what am i eating late at night you know a lot of times like oh i had a glass of wine after dinner i didn't really need that maybe i could have the wine with dinner you know um obviously it's a little trickier for a shift worker but understanding what your eating habits are is a good and really important first step and then once you see that then you could say okay how could i modify this could i have my breakfast 30 minutes or an hour later? Could I have my dinner a little bit earlier? What are these things I'm having after dinner or before breakfast that, you know, don't fall in that category? Do I need them? Could I move them? And then starting to shift them a little bit at a time. So if there's easy things to cut out, you can cut those out. Sometimes that can really shorten your eating window just on that alone. But sometimes it's just a matter of saying, okay, these are the things that are important to me. I'm going to scoot this one 30 minutes this way and this one 30 minutes this way. I'm going to go down by an hour. And do that for a couple of weeks and then do another hour and then do that for a couple of weeks. And you can kind of, you know, taper down slowly um, and kind of do what feels right for you and what you're able to do. And sometimes you might stay maybe at 11 or 12 hours for a while yeah. um, and then, you know, kind of pick back up. And again, I think, you know, even a 12 hour, I think you're going to have a much better situation than just completely erratic schedules. Um, and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different options for that. And again, with the shift schedule, it's hard to give any one piece of advice because there's so many different versions of it. But I think when we think about what we're trying to do, the overall goal is trying to give a consistent cue to your body through food. And it should mainly be when one, when it's light and when you're active. And those things don't always, aren't always the same thing for shift workers. Um, and we're still trying to figure out as a research community, what the optimal, um, eating patterns are for a lot of these really challenging shift schedules. Mm. I love that you've really uh, taken that big picture approach to this and looking at it as the sustainability uh, because, and not, um, again, in the health and wellbeing space, there's a lot of focus on restricting certain foods out and, and so forth. And again, there's a time and a place from a therapeutic kind of version, but we're talking about a long-term sustainability for, you know, people that are working, let's face it, some of the toughest jobs on the planet Um just the shift work alone before we start getting into the their stress related on the, on their job. So I love that. Yeah, you really are taking a, a, a long term vision of this that that will make it and a bit of give and take for people. And also pointing out that uh, yes, changing our habits and our behaviours, we are going to get that instinctual. Oh, this isn't working. Oh, this is too hard. I don't want to kind of do that. But just if you understand what your body truly wants and it really doesn't want you to eat during the night purely because it's not uh, it's literally not hardwired to eat that way uh, when you understand your biology more I think you're more wanting to protect it <laughs> like your life depends on it because it truly does uh, so yeah brilliant a question I did want to ask you uh, now this kind of comes back to because a lot of as you as you beautifully pointed out there's so many different types of shift working jobs and shifts and uh, out there for the people that have maybe they they start work at three or four o'clock in the morning now what is your take on when is the best time for them to actually eat where that alarm clock goes off as I look like to say or one of my clients used to say to me you know goes off at stupid o'clock <laughs> <laughs> what what is the best approach for for people that have those sort they might even just be working like a 4 a.m to 12 shift or something like that so it, it depends on kind of what your life looks like on non-work days too you know if on your work day you're waking up at three and on your off days you're waking up at five then I would probably say, you know, try to eat, maybe start eating around six or seven, you know, give yourself an hour buffer. And 
I kind of use the hour buffer as a, a very general term of like, let your body wake up, let the melatonin levels go down, let your body be ready to receive food. Um, and if that's usually, I'd say an hour is plenty. It could be a little bit shorter, but usually if you give yourself an hour buffer from your off day and then say at least three hours before you go to bed, you're already down. And this is for anyone really, but that you're already down to um, a 12 hour window, assuming you're in bed for eight hours, right? So then you just pick the 10 hours that work for okay. you there. So I would say, yeah, hopefully. So <laughs> I would say, try to go with your, go based off of your off days. Now, if you're someone who's waking up at 3 a.m. for work, and then on off days, you're waking up at nine or 10 because you're just sleeping in. And really, you're going between these really big shifts and when you're sleeping and when you're awake, mm. that gets a little bit trickier. Um, you can still try to say, I'm going to sink to my um, off days because those are usually the harder days to change again, because it comes back to like family meals and things like that, where you can't really change when you're going to eat on those days, whereas on your shifts, you might be able to. Um, but this depends on on you and the individual, right? Like it really depends on what works for you and what could you shift. Ideally, you're eating at the same time every day, whether you're working or not. Again, that may or may not be possible. Um, but I would say if you have these really early morning commutes, I know I've, I've even teachers that you don't think of as a shift worker sometimes have a long commute and the school day starts very early and they have to get there for before school, you know, responsibilities. So they're waking up at four or five in the morning. And there is this old, you know, the old adage of breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And it's like, yeah, yes and no. Mm -hmm. Um, forcing yourself to eat when you're not hungry yet, when your melatonin levels are still high is not good for you. Yeah. Now, this is a little tricky for some occupations where you're not able to eat during the work day. Um, or, or during, unless you have a break, which may or may, you know, depending on when that comes. If possible, I would say take your breakfast with you. Wait until it's a little bit later, till you're actually hungry. Um, and when you have a break or an opportunity to eat, if you're at a desk or somewhere where you can eat while you're working, then that's a lot easier. Um, but I would say to try to do that because I think forcing yourself to eat before your body's ready is never really a good idea. Mm. Um, and especially because as humans, and this has been scientifically shown in studies, but when we're up super early or super late, we don't go for healthy foods. We go for treats, um, high sugar, high salt, high fat. You know, it's the donut in the morning, the coffee with a lot of cream and sugar. You know, these are the things we do to make ourselves feel better when we're under duress and we're, we're going through these really challenging things. And I'm guilty of this, too. I'll even tell myself this with this knowledge and be like, yeah, I know, but you know, I have to get up so early, so I should get this. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's not just just wait. Just wait. Um, we try to kind of give ourselves like a dopamine burst by eating something really yummy, um, especially when we're under these really challenging schedules, but it's that much worse even. Um, so I'd say if you do need to eat something really early or in the middle of the night, you know, don't go for the donut. I know it's tempting. Um, but don't do it. Um, try to go for something that's a little like lower glucose levels, so lower sugar, lower salt, you know, some nuts, some, you know, a hard boiled egg, some avocados, some, you know, fit, something like a healthy, lean protein with healthy fats in it that still can give you some food and satiate you, but isn't going to trigger this huge glucose response that your body isn't able to handle. Um, and this kind of difference in like, okay, if you have to eat, what should you eat? I think is where a lot of the research and shift work is going because there are going to be situations where you need to eat. And if you do need to eat, what is the best thing? And maybe if you have the right types of food, maybe it's not even that bad of a situation, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's okay. And we just don't know that yet. And so that's where a lot of our research is heading is to find out, all right, not eating during your shift is not always possible. So what do you do then? And that's kind of where we're headed. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Just, yeah. Having a, a, a plan B, uh, be prepared. Um, I can yeah. relate to the, the donut scenario. I remember my sister's a, a nurse and I remember she was saying when she worked in the emergency department, one of the doctors said, you know, uh, said, right, okay, I'm doing a coffee and donut run. Who's in, <laughs> who's, you know, uh, during the end of their shift. And when she said it, I went, 
a what and a what run (laughs) after like end of night shift like two of the worst things that you could possibly have when you're wanting to go home and and sleep and and stuff but yeah like it's it's a challenging job like the stresses alone shift work is a stress shift work is an endocrine hormonal disruptor um but then you've got the actual job on top of it as well and you kind of you, you get where people are coming from and and as you alluded to before doing it every now and then no big deal more likely but it's yeah yeah it's a long term it shouldn't be the norm (laughs) yeah Yeah, because that you know where our health becomes very unraveled and so forth but yeah um brilliant well yeah this has been great so I guess um is there anything else um that uh that you that I may have not asked in the questioning that you think that might be relevant for um for our listeners oh that's a great question I'm sure there's lots more we could discuss um I would say to my point earlier of understanding when you eat and you know what that means for your body and just getting a good understanding um so the app that our lab runs and has created it's it's not sold to anyone there's no it's all all your data is protected and it's just for research only um and it's free to use on iPhones and Androids it's called my circadian clock um and it's available for anyone to use if you're interested in learning more about yourself you can mm-hmm. um log your current lifestyle you can set goals um, but it's a, it's a good way to get an understanding of where you are. Um, and once you have that information, it's really empowering to say, okay, what, what can I change? What can't I change? Um, and then again, trying to figure out which foods are really, um, are going to be healthier options for you when you're on your shift and trying to not use that as, as the best way to, you know, finding other ways to kind of get through the night other than the indulgent food, which again, much easier said than done. I realize it's, it's, it's so challenging. And like you said, the stress alone, um, it, it's very hard. And I, I think, you know, we're talking about shift work, which obviously is extremely important. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of situations in our life that for people that aren't shift workers that do some kind of shift work. Um, I have two children and, you know, those first few months of life is a very intense shift work where you're you're around the clock and it, you don't get days off, you know. Um, and so we keep people like that in mind, too. Like, what do you do when you're that disrupted and, and what can we do to feel any kind of better? And so <laughs> in, in addition to all the shift workers in your life, I'm sure everyone here knows people who have had children and everyone has gone through this kind of disruption. So it's something everyone can relate to. It's not just the shift work problem. It's just again, like most things, more complicated for shift workers. And I'd say the other thing that is um, a real challenge with shift work is almost every clinical trial excludes shift workers because yeah. we know that it's so yeah. confounding yeah. because you have such a difficult schedule. And so that's one of the reasons we're so excited about studying it because we know it's a very underserved population um, and we want to take on that challenge. But when you're reading things about different health interventions or medications or things, or even recommendations you get. Almost none of them are done on shift work. So listening to your body, understanding your body, a lot of it now, unfortunately, you still kind of have to figure out how to make all this science work for you because it hasn't directly studied shift workers before. Um, and so it's it's a challenge. If there's research that comes out in your area where you can participate, I say, please do it because we need shift workers in research. Um, And we need to be able to understand everybody a lot better because it's just been a very underserved population for far too long. Mm, Yeah, and that's why I'm so excited um, for your work, um, Emily. And and you genuinely are, it's something that you're quite passionate about as well because, uh, yeah, we are, we're definitely one of the most misunderstood populations on the the planet. That is, yeah, that's absolutely for sure. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, for anybody that wants to, I know you you just um, briefly mentioned your app that you that you that you use. Uh, could, could you, if anybody's listening and they want to learn more about your work, what you're doing, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can find us um, on our website, which is mycircadianclock.org, or on our uh, other lab webpage, which is uh, through Salk, which is S A L K, the Salk Institute and the Panda Lab. Uh, so you can look us up there. You can also just use Google Scholar or just Google me <laughs> um, at Emily Manukian, um, or follow me on Twitter at Emily Manukian or at Emily Manukian, um, just my full name. 
Um, and yeah, we post our papers that are coming out and you can kind of see what's going on there. Um, and I think most of our papers are av freely available for anyone to read. So through um, through any kind of search engine, you can find us and uh, read more about our work. Brilliant. Excellent. And I'll leave a link to your paper actually um, in the show notes um, to this uh, podcast as well so that our listeners, for those that are that love all the the really the science, the deep science, can actually go out and find it and, and read it. But, yeah, so thank you so much uh, for joining me um, on this podcast. It's been an absolute treat and it, it's so lovely to meet you. I actually did meet um, Dr. Sachin Panda at a sleep conference in the in um in Australia quite a few uh, years ago now but it's uh yeah I'm my it, it fills my heart to know that there's this this research is really starting to grow in momentum because it's very much needed um yeah for all of your work yeah absolutely and actually Australia has one of the really good populations of circadian clinical researchers in the world um there's a lot of good research going on there so I think you'll see a lot of good things coming up there as well yeah, through the Appleton Institute, Central Queensland University, and yeah, there's there's quite a yeah quite a bit going on, which is University of Adelaide, University of Melbourne. Um, yep. There's a few really good circadian researchers out there. Yeah, yeah, exciting, exciting time. So yeah, so yeah, thank you so much um, again for for jumping on, and um, yeah, and to all of our listeners, thank you so much for for tuning in for today's podcast. I hope you found it helpful. Please, um, by all means, if you found our conversation uh, beneficial, share it with other shift workers who you think may benefit too, and even go ahead and give us a five star rating. That actually helps me to reach more people to help like yourself. All right, until next time.